now that we talked about this, I'm happy to introduce Alex, who is a, well, he's a postdoc here in Bonn, and he's going to talk about recent developments in bar of values time frequency analysis. Right, thanks. So, yeah, for a while I've talked about this topic, and usually when I talk about it outside of Bonn, I basically give a talk about what time frequency analysis is, and I don't say very much about my own results or anything really new. But I figure, you know, th this is Bonn. People sort of know what time frequency analysis is. I'm, I, I shouldn't assume that everybody knows what time frequency analysis is, so I, so I won't. But this is going to be one of those talks, which is essentially a long ad for my papers. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I hate these talks, but now I feel like this is the, the right time for me to give this talk because, okay, Gennady or Altsev and I have spent a bit of time working on this broad project. We've built a framework. We have a couple of nice results. It's a good time for me to give the, the overview of what we've been doing broadly on the whole. So where do I start? I start by figuring out how to change slides on my PDF viewer. Maybe this way we'll do. So yeah, the talk is about Barnack valued analysis for the most part. And let me give the very quick overview of that. What's Barnack valued analysis and why is Barnack valued analysis? Very roughly speaking, it's about looking at functions that map into a Barnack space, which is typically an infinite dimensional Barnack space. And I'm just looking at functions on the real line, but there's nothing stopping you from taking a general measure space here. Can I like actually, oh, sorry, just a second, I'll do this properly. If I use my keyboard, I can change slides right. Why would we do this? One common application of this is it lets you write PDEs as ODEs, but valued in Barnack spaces, typically function spaces. So typically you'll take your Barnack space X to be something like LP or a Sobolev space or some other function space on some domain. Then yeah, you can take a PDE like something like a, a heat equation and write it as an ODE with some operators involved. Uh, but also it's got applications in operator theory. So for example, you can take your Barnack space to be a space of operators rather than a space of functions. And a nice application is you take X to be a non-commutative LP space. So this is a space of operators associated with a von Neumann algebra with a trace. And classical commutative LP spaces are a subset of this, the commutative case. Or you can also just do what's called centipede mathematics, which is really the reason I do it, which is according to Zygmunt, when you take a centipede and you pull off 99 of its legs and you see what it can still do. So for me, the, the purpose of Barnack valued analysis is centipede analysis and particularly centipede harmonic analysis, which is what I'm particularly interested in. So an example of Barnack valued harmonic analysis is the Hilbert transform, right? If you have a, a Barnack valued function, so this is the X here, a Barnack valued Schwartz function, you can define a Hilbert transform of that thing. It's defined in exactly the same way as the classical scalar valued Hilbert transform, but now this integral that appears in the principal value, this is a Bochner integral. So this is valued in X. You take a vector valued function, you integrate it, you get a vector out. And the question of whether this is bounded on LP, which is the, the main question you ask about the Hilbert transform, was answered by Burkholder and Bogan. Your Hilbert transform is bounded on LP, valued in X, of course. This is a Bochner Lebesgue space. The Hilbert transform is bounded on the X valued LP space for some or equivalently all P in the usual range, if and only if X has what's called the UMD property. This UMD property is a, it's a probabilistic property because it's in terms of Martingale differences but it's got many different characterizations using different types of functions or martingales or whatever. The key examples of UMD spaces are Hilbert spaces. Hilbert spaces are the best Barnack spaces. Most reflexive Barnack spaces, most reflexive function spaces, sorry, are UMD. I underline most and reflexive because UMD implies reflexive and because there are some strange counter examples. So most but also non-commutative LP spaces. These ones that have applications to operator theory, these versions of LP spaces are also UMD. Right. So what makes Barnack valued analysis difficult and therefore interesting? Firstly, you can't multiply functions point-wise, unless you have a way of multiplying your vectors, but that involves extra structure on your Barnack space. You can always assume that sort of extra structure and the analysis becomes a bit easier. 
but in the abstract, you can't multiply vectors and therefore you can't multiply functions point-wise. Uh, L2 suddenly loses its role as a Hilbert space. If X is not isomorphic to a Hilbert space, neither is L2. So you don't have this nice, you know, P equals two case that you can then extrapolate from anymore. Um, related phenomenon here, Plancherel's theorem fails. Fourier transforms not going to map L2 to L2 unless X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. So your main, you know, strong tool in Fourier analysis is gone. So we really are taking the 99 legs off the centipede here. So orthogonality arguments, okay, you don't have a Hilbert space lying around. You don't really have orthogonality in any reasonable sense. So all of your orthogonality arguments have to be replaced by something like probabilistic techniques using Martin-Gale decompositions or so on, which makes sense when you think of what the UMD property is. It's about unconditionality of Martin-Gale differences. If you can represent your things in terms of Martin-Gales, maybe this is gonna work out for you. But one, one thing that does work is Littlewood-Paley theory and to an extent Calder and Zygmunt theory. If your Barnack space is a UMD space, these things still work roughly as expected. Not exactly as expected, but you have a, a new form of Littlewood-Paley decompositions and theorems. You have boundedness of Calder and Zygmunt operators. If the scalar valued versions are bounded, their vector valued counterparts are also bounded for UMD spaces only. So UMD spaces are really the the natural class of function space of, of Barnack spaces to work with when doing Barnack valued harmonic analysis. There are plenty of theorems that say so and so operator is bounded if and only if the Barnack space is UMD. There's no escaping the UMD property here. So that's just a short overview of Barnack valued analysis. Now, what's time frequency analysis and why is time frequency analysis? Instead of giving a direct definition, I'm going to give a a sort of operational definition of time frequency analysis. What does time frequency analysis do? I'm going to describe it in terms of two questions. Question one, do you have convergence of Fourier integrals? So you have the Fourier inversion formula of a function. Does that integral in some sense converge to the original function or in what sense? Do you have it point-wise? Point-wise is the thing we particularly care about here. And if it does, how fast does it converge? This is a good question to ask. It's been, it's been mostly answered, of course. And a second seemingly unrelated, but this is Bond, so we know it's not unrelated. Seemingly unrelated question. Does this operator here, the bilinear Hilbert transform, satisfy any LP bounds? What these two questions, or three questions, if you count this question, what these have in common is you answer them all using time frequency analysis. I'll describe the questions and what's known about them and say something about the proof. And that's going to tell you roughly what time frequency analysis is without going too in depth. So let's look at convergence of Fourier integrals. We want to know whether we have this limit here, point-wise in X or almost everywhere point-wise in X. I should say before this extension thing, I've written here, this limit actually does hold for Schwartz functions using the smoothness and the decay. You can prove this directly. It holds everywhere for all X. So if you have an every if you have a convergent sorry a pointwise convergence property for a dense class of functions in some function space and you want to establish the same property for all functions in a function space, you bound a maximal operator, right? The associated maximal operator for this problem is the Carlson operator, or the Carlson maximal operator, which takes these partial Fourier integrals and takes a supremum over all of them, so you get a maximal function. If you can show that that's bounded on LP you get the almost everywhere pointwise convergence of Fourier integrals. And the difficulty here is that the Carlson operator is modulation invariant. So if you take your function and you modulate it by a frequency, it has the effect of just changing the top frequency in this partial Fourier integral. And of course, when you take the supremum over all of these top frequencies, that doesn't change the supremum, does it? So the Carlson operator doesn't see modulations. Now, if you have an operator and it's modulation invariant, I don't know if people can see the last line on the screen. Can everybody see that? Cool. Modulation invariant operators demand modulation invariant techniques. If your techniques are not modulation invariant, you're not going to be able to bound this operator. And your classical Calder and Zygmunt methods or Littlewood-Paley methods, they're not modulation invariant. They all involve something like a fixed base frequency zero that everything is decomposed around. So yeah, 
low modulation invariance, that's not going to be good enough to bound the Carlson operator. But anyway, the Carlson operator is bounded. Feffman proved it. Lacey and Teela proved it. I don't think Carlson proved it. He used a different method to prove his theorem, but Carlson would have known how to do it, I presume. Carlson operator is bounded on LP for all P in the reflexive range. Now, the, the gross simplification of how to do this, which is giving you the idea of what time frequency analysis really is, this operator's got a three-dimensional space of symmetries, translation, modulation, and dilation. So you somehow want to represent everything in terms of this time frequency scale space, parametrizing the invariances of the operator. So you're, and then once you make these representations, and I'll say more about them later on, you find regions of this space, they're called trees, where you have a frequency which is roughly fixed. So this is basically forgetting about the modulation invariance and just looking at the dilation and translation invariances, which is essentially doing calderon zygmunt theory or Littlewood-Paley theory, or however you want to think about that. So there are regions called trees in the time frequency scale space where the analysis is calderon zygmunt flavored. It's not exactly calderon zygmunt but the same methods sort of work. Then you use some covering arguments, very clever covering arguments to take the analysis in these local regions that behave well and somehow patch them together to get the estimates you want. As I said, this is a very gross simplification. I have skipped a lot of details. There are a lot of unfortunate technicalities. This is a, a page from Pfefferman's paper. Even he acknowledges that the technicalities are unfortunate, not only for the typesetters that had to do this back in the 70s. Anyway. We can move on to variational Carlson operators. So bounding the Carlson operator tells you when your Fourier, Fourier integrals converge point-wise almost everywhere. But it doesn't tell you anything about how fast the convergence is. This is where variational Carlson operators come in. You define this operator, which is sort of like the Carlson one, but instead of taking a supremum over all partial Fourier integrals, you take the R variation over all partial Fourier integrals. You do this point-wise in X. This is the R variation of a sequence. You probably know variation, which is one variation, and you know the supremum, which is infinity variation, and R variation goes between. So boundedness of this R variation, the Carlson operator, will control the rate of convergence of this thing. If you bound it, it will say not only does it converge, but the sequence of partial things, of partial Fourier integrals, is going to have bounded R variation almost everywhere. And that's a, essentially a, a rate of decay or a rate of convergence condition in a somewhat implicit way. And this control gets stronger as R decreases. So the easiest case is R equals infinity. That's the Carlson operator. The hardest case would be R equals one. And here's a theorem that says that this operator is bounded on LP. You have it for all P, but the, the threshold, the amount of of R and the R variation you can handle gets weaker as P approaches one. So as P approaches one, you start to say less and less and less about the variational Carlson operator. And in the limit, all the, well, in the limit, you have nothing, but hypothetically in the limit, all you would have is the Carlson operator with no variation. Well, but this is more recent. This is 2012 and 2016. Everything here is still scalar valued, I should point out. I haven't written anything about the method of proof, but it's, it's the same key ideas as for the Carlson operator. Time frequency scale decomposition, find nice regions and so on. But the analysis on those nice regions becomes harder for a variety of reasons, because you're dealing with variations here. I'm not going to say any more about that, but it's the same key idea. The technicalities just become harder and more unfortunate, perhaps. What about the bilinear Hilbert transform? This other operator that I said was bounded in similar ways Lacey and Teela, and of course many other people have done variations of this theorem and added versions of this theorem, have said that the bilinear Hilbert transform is bounded for a large variety of exponents. Maybe this isn't sharp, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not particularly interested in which exponents is true for, just that it's true for a lot of exponents, right? The key idea, they're the same key ideas. Again, grossly simplified. You have to represent everything on a time frequency scale space. This operator has the same translation, dilation, and modulation invariances as the Carlson and variational Carlson operators. You identify regions of the space where the frequency is fixed and all the analysis is Calder and Zygmunt-ish, right? It's the same ideas. I am running out of space on my screen somehow. <laughs> 
Very clever covering arguments. I can't stress enough how clever these covering arguments are. They are quite clever. So you can take your BHT and you can generalize that a bit further to more general Fourier multipliers. So let me say what a bilinear Fourier multiplier is. We're defining this operator T sub M on pairs of functions. We're defining it by duality. So this is gonna give a third function and we're gonna pair that against another function to get a, a number. This defines a trilinear form. And if you define a trilinear form, you've defined an associated adjoint bilinear operator. This is how these operators look. So we're integrating over a plane gamma, which is the frequencies psi and R3 that sum to zero. We have our symbol M of the multiplier, which is defined on this space gamma. And you just take the, the Fourier transforms of Fi, multiply them and apply the symbol F. Point wise, that's a, tri that's a trilinear Fourier multiplier form or equivalently a bilinear Fourier multiplier operator. Uh, an example is the bilinear Hilbert transform. So let me draw, this is basically a placeholder for my diagram here. This is the plane gamma sitting inside R3. My geometric drawing is not fantastic. So we're gonna draw it as a two dimensional plane forgetting how it sits exactly. These are the Xi1 and Xi2 axes. And if you take this symbol here, so you take the line Xi2 equals Xi1, you tell your symbol to be pi i above that line and minus pi i below that line. This operator is the bilinear Hilbert transform written as a Fourier multiplier. And this is a, this symbol is translation invariant in the, along this singular direction. And this translation invariance, well, my diagram is gone. Sorry, it's only on that slide. You've seen the diagram. When you have this invariance along a certain direction, that's telling you that the associated operator has a translation invariance because translation and modulation are, are swapped under the Fourier transform. So you see the modulation invariance of the bilinear Hilbert transform through the translation invariance of its symbol. And you can ask, okay, what about more general multipliers, more general symbols that have this kind of invariance so this leads to the muscala tau theorem from 2001. It says if you have an, a symbol, so let's, this is going to be our singular direction, alpha. It's going to be a non-degenerate one, which means that all its components are non-zero. Don't think too hard about that. If your symbol is defined away from the singular line and it has appropriate bounds and smoothness conditions, which says that it can be sort of singular as you approach the singular line, but not too badly then your associated operator is going to have the same bounds as the bilinear Hilbert transform, or at least you can prove the same bounds as the bilinear Hilbert transform. This is just in the trilinear case, Muscala Tartila did more than that, but I'm just talking trilinear here just for simplicity. And how do you go about proving this, right? In this case, we don't necessarily have modulation invariant operators or translation invariant symbols, but this condition only involves the distance of the frequency to the span of alpha. This is that line on which you have a singularity. So the condition is translation invariant or modulation invariant, however you want to look at it. So the idea here, you still represent everything on your time frequency scale space, but now this is parameterizing the invariances of the assumptions, not of the multipliers themselves. Of course, the multipliers might have this symmetry, but you don't assume that so strongly. And all of the other key ideas are as before. You get your trees, you do Calder and Zygmunt type theory on those, you put them together in a clever way. There you go, time frequency analysis, you've proven an estimate. I'm really skipping over a lot of details here. Very grossly simplified, right? It's not that simple. Right, so let's get Barnack valued while we still have time. What are the core questions in Barnack valued time frequency analysis? at least from my point of view. I am a biased narrator here. What do I say the core questions are? Question one, you have a Fourier inversion formula for Banach valued functions. This is the, the Fourier transform of an X valued function. It's defined exactly as in the scalar case, but now this is a Bochner integral. Does this Fourier integral hold point wise as it does in the scalar case for LP functions? If it does, how fast is the convergence? Same question as before, but now it's a Barnack valued function, right? Question two, we're gonna define a bilinear Hilbert transform. 
But before we can do that, we need to say, okay, let's take some Banach spaces and let's assume, or let's take as input a bounded by a linear operator that's telling you how to multiply vectors. Remember I said before, you can't multiply vectors in a Banach space. Well, a bilinear operator is sort of, it's a replacement for a multiplication of vectors at least. There are many options of bilinear operators pi that you can take here. You can define a bilinear Hilbert transform in terms of that data. It's defined in the same way, but now instead of taking the product of F1 and F2, you use pi to give you a vector in the third Banach space X. So I have three Banach spaces lying around. Does that have any LP estimates? And the third question, speaking of modulation invariant Fourier multipliers or Fourier multipliers that have singularities along a line, what about those in the Banach valued setting? What can we say about them? So of course I've picked these three core questions because I have answers to these three core questions. There are more questions you can ask. This is not the full story, but this is just a, you know, this is an update to what's current. These questions we can answer to an extent. Before I can state the results, I need to talk about intermediate UMD spaces. So remember we had this UMD class of Banach spaces that were the natural spaces for harmonic analysis. I didn't explicitly define them. I just said they're the spaces for which the Hilbert transform is bounded. That definition will do for us. We need something that's formally slightly better. So we have this notion of R intermediate. Uh, a Banach space is, is intermediate UMD if it's a complex interpolation space between a UMD space and a Hilbert space. So it's still UMD, but it's got a little bit of Hilbertianness to it. You can use this interpolation property to take some orthogonality estimates in your Hilbert space and some UMD estimates in the other UMD space and combine them somehow. Uh, we make that quantifiable. We talk about R intermediate, just to say how far along the interpolation scale you are. It's defined in such a way that two intermediate UMD is the same as being isomorphic to a Hilbert space, like L2. That's where the two comes from. Infinity intermediate UMD is just UMD. It says you're on the right of such an interpolation scale in some formal sense. And to give the example of LP, what happens for LP? Uh, it's R intermediate UMD for all R greater than the maximum of P and P prime. So you think of P greater than two and less than infinity. That is, it's not P intermediate UMD, but it almost is. It's R intermediate UMD for all R greater than P. The way you see this is you write LP as an interpolation space between L2 and L infinity or L2 and L1, depending on where P is. And L1 and L infinity are not UMD. They're not reflexive. But when you write, so this, you would get, if L infinity were UMD, then LP would be P intermediate UMD, but L infinity is not, you lose epsilon. Now it is conjectured that every UMD space is R intermediate UMD for some R, but this has not been answered. This is still a conjecture, unfortunately. So these are the classes of the spaces that we have results for. So let me give you the state of the art before 2019. So the old state of the art. You have a Carlson operator. So thinking about convergence of Fourier series or Fourier integrals, this is your X value to Carlson operator. It's still a maximal operator, but now you take the norm in X instead of the absolute value. Uh, Hutton and Lacey showed that if your Banach space is R intermediate UMD for some finite R, doesn't matter which, then the Carlson operator is bounded on all LP. Here you might just say intermediate UMD rather than R intermediate UMD, meaning that it's R intermediate for some finite R. And the way this is proven, I mean, the key ideas of time frequency analysis are still there. Like you localize to trees, you do some stuff, but now the fact that you don't have things like Poincaré's theorem or classical orthogonality arguments makes your life quite difficult. The key idea is that on the calderon zygmunt flavored regions on the trees, you want to do, you know, calderon zygmunt theory. And calderon zygmunt theory sort of works in UMD spaces. So at least on individual trees, you can do your arguments and things work. Up there are technicalities, it's not so simple, but that's the idea. And the sort of clever decomposition arguments that you do to put all the trees together to combine these estimates, this is where you use this interpolation property this intermediate UMD property. 
if you were working with a Hilbert space, you could use orthogonality arguments or almost orthogonality arguments legitimately. Um, if you're just in a UMD space with no extra information, you don't have any of that. But if you're in between, you can do something. You can use interpolation and get some boundedness of certain, some sort of almost orthogonality properties of in LR somehow of operators that are associated with trees that are, are disjoint or far apart. I'm skipping a lot of technicalities, but th these are the two key ideas. On trees, you use UMD. And when you're combining trees, you interpolate with Hilbert spaces to give you some orthogonality. Then you have to actually, you know, turn the machine on, do the work. It's a bit of work. It's not so easy. That's for bounds of the Carlson operator. On the other side, okay, this is about intermediate UMD spaces in the abstract. This result here is for particular Barnack spaces. So the the helicoidal method, Benem Muscalu, this deals with the case where your Barnack space is a mixed norm Lebesgue space. So you have LP1 or LR1 valued in LR2, valued in dot, 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 valued in L. You have N measure spaces and you have a Lebesgue space on each one and you define a mixed norm. So they have many results that follow from this helicoidal method. I'm just stating the one, that, the most direct application to the bilinear Hilbert transform. If your exponents satisfy a holder relation component wise, and you take this product map between the mixed norm spaces that holders inequality will tell you that product maps bounded, then the bilinear Hilbert transform associated with that particular bilinear form, this product map has, has estimates. It's bounded for a large range of exponents. I'm not quantifying the exponents. I'll just say it's a large range. So this isn't a fully abstract result because it only works for mixed norm spaces and it only works for the product map, but it's a very nice result. Key idea of this, okay, you're not using UMD directly. You're actually using that you have a mixed norm space. The idea here is you take the localized estimates that you would get from using the time frequency method in the scalar case. You take a particular form of that estimate and you show that you can induct on that. You show that if you've got this particular type of localized estimate, you can then get it with one extra degree of mixed norm on the inside and you induct. You show that if you can do this at level n, so if you have an n, a depth n mixed norm space, you can get the same estimate at n plus one. This is where the supposed helicoidal method comes from. It's a, it's a helicoid, it's induction, but you know, helicoid. But as I said, that's just for mixed norm spaces. Well, I jumped too far ahead. This, in a sense, is the 2019 state of the art. I am missing a couple of results, but uh, in my view, these are the main two. From now, I'm gonna talk about some new results and hopefully I get some time, I will have time to talk a bit about the proofs. So, Hutton and Lacey showed that the Carlson operator is bounded for intermediate UMD spaces. But what about the variational Carlson operator? What can you say about the rate of convergence of a Fourier series or Fourier integral? This is the x-valued variational Carlson operator. So of course you define the, the R variation with a, with a norm instead of an absolute value. And Gennady and I proved uh, early this year, okay, we finished the proof early this year. If X is R intermediate UMD for some value of let's say R zero, you can sort of forget about the exponents, they're a bit fiddly you can get a result for all R that's greater than that R zero. And P has to be greater than this particular exponent here, whatever that is. And then you get the bound you like. And if you take R to infinity, you, so as R goes to infinity here, this exponent here goes to one because the thing inside the bracket goes to infinity. And then the holder conjugate of that makes it go to one. As you send R to infinity, you get the Hutton and Lacey bounds for the Carlson operator. So we recover that. And what happens if you really look at the exponents is as R zero approaches two, you get the scalar valued result in its full strength. As R zero approaches infinity, you have less assumptions, you get less bounds. That makes sense. I should also add if X is a mixed norm space, so not a general intermediate UMD space, or if X is a Barnack function space, so a Barnack space, which is actually a function space and has a norm that's compatible with the, the order structure on functions, there are stronger results by the helicoidal method or by uh, weighted extrapolation methods. But I'm most interested in this 
abstract intermediate UMD setting. Right, that's just a statement of a theorem. I'm going to talk about the proofs later on. Uh, for the bilinear Hilbert transform, we have a result, which was also proven by Duplinio, Lee, Martikainen, and Vorinen on, on the same day, according to the archive. <laughs> uh, right, so we have to have three Barnack spaces as input. We suppose each of them is R intermediate UMD, so let's call the intermediacy exponent Ri. And we need this extra assumption, which we are going to talk about a bit later on, that these intermediacy assumptions, these exponents have to, they have to be sufficiently small jointly. The best situation possible is when all three of them are two. And then this thing on the left becomes three on two, which is greater than one. The worst possible situation is when they're all infinity. <laughs> and then the thing on the left-hand side is zero, which is certainly less than one. So they all, they need to be small enough, basically. Under these assumptions, um, for any bounded bilinear map, pi, of this form, the associated bilinear Hilbert transform is bounded for a range of exponents. Uh, it's not an existence result. We do say what the exponents are. I just don't like to say what they are in talks because they're confusing. Um, interestingly enough, <laughs> this result does not cover the Lebesgue spaces you think it will. This is kind of funny. So if you take, for example, uh, the product map between Lebesgue spaces, on R. For that to be bounded, you need some Holder scaling. And that Holder scaling will tell you that the intermediacy exponents you have are going to sum to something less than one. <laughs> and we need greater than one. I haven't given every detail of this argument here, but the problem is that LP spaces over R don't fit in this setting. And this is for good reason. The result's not true in general, actually. If you take your pi to be BHT, so that you have a BHT associated with BHT, the corresponding operator is a sort of bi-parameter bilinear Hilbert transform, and that's been shown to have no LP estimates, so that result can't be true. On the other hand, that sounds pretty bad. On the other hand, if you take sequence spaces, little LP, or you take Schatten classes here, these are non-commutative LP spaces associated with the von Neumann algebra B of H, through Hilbert space H. If your exponents PI, uh, well, it should be one on PI. If you have this kind of super holder scaling, then the, you will actually have boundedness of, for example, a product map. You'll have holders inequality, but you can then use inclusions of sequence spaces to say, okay, if I have some of one on PI is greater than one, this is still bounded. And the R, you will be able to find exponents RI that satisfy what they need to satisfy in this case. So although we don't manage to cover Lebesgue spaces over R, we can cover some Lebesgue spaces and we can cover some spaces of operators that are not function spaces. So this is still interesting. The reason for this is that we've assumed nothing on pi other than boundedness. This is a key fact here. When you look at something like the helicoidal method that Benet and Muscalo have, they prove lots of results for Lebesgue spaces and for mixed norm spaces, but their, their bilinear map pi is the product map. It's a very particular bilinear operator. And some bilinear operators, for example, the bilinear Hilbert transform itself, are not so well behaved. I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk with regard to future questions. Um, why do I have a blank slide here? I don't think I meant to have a blank slide here. Something's gone wrong with my tech. I'm supposed to have a heading here. This is about multipliers. Right. So what about trilinear Fourier multipliers? Yeah. So if you have a bilinear form pi and you have a symbol m, you can define a, a vector valued trilinear uh, bilinear Fourier multiplier operator T m tensor pi by using pi to give you what this trilinear pairing should be. So you take the product of these two functions and then this is x3 star valued so you take the dual pairing against that and you simply multiply by the symbol M point-wise. Then what Duplinio, et cetera, actually showed, so they have this result for the BHT that we also proved. What they actually showed was a multiplier theorem 
So under the same assumptions on the Barnack spaces that we had in the last slide, this intermediacy assumption, there exists a range of exponents, uh, a large range of exponents such that for any bounded bilinear pi, again, any, and any symbol M that satisfies, I guess, what I'll call the Moscow or Tartila assumptions, it's singular along a certain line, but it has nice decay or nice bounds and smoothness away from that. You have boundedness of the associated bilinear Fourier multiplier. This implies the results of BHT because you take M to be I pi sine of xi2 minus xi1. But this only covers scalar valued symbols. That's not a bad thing. This is a very good result, but it only covers scalar valued symbols. Uh, okay, I'm seriously having tech issues here. This is not gonna be good. All right. So I'm gonna give an operator valued multiplier result. Consider the space of bounded trilinear forms. We call it tri of x dot. And let's look at a multiplier which has a symbol that's valued in the space of trilinear forms. So compared to the previous slide, instead of taking a particular bilinear form that's bounded and then modifying it with a scalar valued symbol, let's just directly take a trilinear form valued symbol. These are all vectors and this is a trilinear form. Right. We have a theorem, it's, I'll say 2021 because the paper's not finished yet, but it's pretty close. It was almost 2020. So under the same Barnack space assumptions as a previous result, there exists a range of exponents such that whenever you have a symbol of this form satisfying some interesting, well, I guess we'll call a conical R bound Muscala Tartila condition, you have boundedness of the operator. I'm not going to define the condition exactly, but I'm going to draw a bit of a diagram of what this condition looks like. You've got your plane gamma. You've got some singular line span of some vector. And what you need is that for every frequency psi zero on that singular line, you draw a double cone coming out from that point in gamma. You get this double cone here, you would call that V of psi zero with a certain aperture kappa that says what the angle is. Uh, if you look at the symbol, the set of operators coming from that cone, so this is a, a set of trilinear forms, you need this to have a certain R bound or R smoothness condition uniformly. I'm not going to say what R boundedness or R smoothness is, but I can just describe it. R boundedness is a property of a set of operators that is strictly and significantly stronger than uniform boundedness. It's really an operator theoretic property of a set of operators. And to check it, it does not suffice to check every operator individually. You have to look at all finite subsets of the set at once, in a sense. It's quite complicated and operator theoretically quite intricate. It's equivalent to uniform boundedness in, in Hilbert spaces, but we're not working with Hilbert spaces. You need a, a uniform R bound and an R bound and R smoothness condition on every one of these cones as your frequency goes along the singular line. And you can't reduce this to a, a uniform bound on the whole set gamma. You have to really look at all cones individually. We're still investigating how necessary this is. It is somewhat necessary. Some sort of R boundedness is necessary, but we're still whittling it down to the minimal thing possible. This paper will come out soon, it'll be interesting. So yeah, we can handle, I guess what you would call operator valued trilinear or bilinear Fourier multipliers rather than just scalar valued. Right, okay, what's left of the talk? I think I have 20 minutes or so. It's gonna be an, a very rough outline of the framework and you can you can go. You don't have to, to listen to this part if you don't want to, but you, you I guess you probably want to at this point. It's a Zoom talk. You're free to mute yourself and you know turn off your video and not even be there. I mean, I assume half of you aren't even here. So yeah, extremely rough. All right, all of my headings are missing. <laughs> I really, this tech is, oh no, here they are. They weren't missing at all. I just needed to scroll. Okay. The key idea in all of our framework is the notion of the wave packet embedding of a function. This is the same kind of idea that goes back to Pfefferman, to Lacey Teela, whatever. This, this is not the newest idea, 
But when you take a Banach valued function f and you take a Schwartz function phi, which is our wave packet, and you take a point eta yt in this space here, this is our frequency time scale space. Okay, frequency time and scale are not necessarily in the right order, but you know, eta's frequency. You take this function here, this is the wave packet embedding of f associated with phi. So you take f and you take this this blob of function. It's got scale t, it's got frequency eta, it's got time or space parameter, whatever, y. And you look at this over all of those points and you get a vector x. This gives you the localized time frequency scale information of the function f at each point. Now the, the real key idea in our work is not to consider this purely as a function of e to y and t, but also to think of it as a function of phi. So you don't just look at some testing wave packet and look at the data at each point, you actually look at it as a function of wave packets. So we have a particular space of testing functions, they're band limited wave packets, we call it phi, I'm not gonna say what it is, but it's a, it's a particular Frechet space. And we consider this embedding map E as a function from X valued Schwartz functions into functions valued in this space here, the linear operators from the Frechet space phi into the Banach space X. So that this embedding, this embedded function E of F is a function and its values are generalized distributions because you, you're free to vary the testing function. And we exploit this very heavily. This is an intrinsic part of the structure that makes everything work. Right. Um, what do I want to say? So this space here, the Borel functions from the time frequency space into these generalized distributions, we could call these generalized functions. We haven't really given them a formal name, but generalized functions will do. And in general, these don't have to be related to embeddings of functions on R. Often they are, but they're not always. And we need to quantify appropriately for like a given generalized function, how far is this from an embedded function to, to make our arguments work. So we have some trees and sizes. So trees are the Calder and Zygmunt flavored regions that I was talking about. To define trees, you have, you have a base frequency interval, contains the unit ball around the origin. This is part of the input data. You've got a theta, you've got a set called a model tree which is like a, thinking of the time frequency space as being like a manifold. This model tree is like a local coordinate chart. It's a particular set. You don't have to worry about what the set is. We've got local coordinate maps that take this local coordinate patch and move it around the time frequency space. Again, ignore the definitions. And this leads us to the definition of a tree with the top particular point based at the frequency interval theta. You take this model tree, this, this coordinate chart, you use the coordinate maps associated with the correct point. And this is what's called a tree. Ignore the definitions. You will forget the definitions. <laughs> Don't worry about them. The key point is that these are the color and Zygmunt flavored regions, in a sense. The fact that the frequency is fixed is saying that you've got this base frequency interval. This is saying like, okay, I don't want my frequencies to go that far beyond zero but they can go a little bit beyond zero. And then I move that frequency interval around in the coordinate map. So this frequency is happening here, you know. It, it's not comprehensible at this point, don't worry about it. Okay, I have a note to myself here. For one of these generalized functions on the time frequency scale space, and for a tree, T, we define what's called a size, which is a way of measuring the function on that set or the generalized function on that set. And our size, this is the size, the total size, is a sum of four other sizes. And I need to explain what these are and my PDF editors, yeah, okay, here we go. Being a bit slow. This is some sort of L infinity norm on the tree, as you can see by the notation, L infinity. This is a randomized norm. Which encodes something like a a Littlewood Paley square function on particular parts of the tree. It uses what's called gamma redonifying operators in Barnack spaces to get the square functions right. And we have these things here, which are defects or defect sizes. 
And the purpose of these is to measure how far this f is from being an embedded function. If this generalized function f is an embedded function e of f, then these defect sizes will vanish. And if f is an embedded function, but truncated to a tree or truncated to a complement of a tree, these defect sizes, these defects will be very small. And that's what these are used in. The kind of arguments we need to actually prove things demand that we have these defect sizes in. It's quite complicated. I'll, I'll, we'll hopefully get to that later on. You don't need to know the form of this size, just know that it exists and it's defined as a sum of quantities that we know how to control. Here is our main workhorse theorem for the entire framework. This is just for a single Barnack space, which is intermediate UMD. We have bounds of the embedding map from LP into these spaces here. These are outer Lebesgue spaces, first developed by Doe and Thiele in, I guess, 2015. 2015? Sounds about right. And these spaces use the definition of the size on individual trees and then combine them in a certain way to give an LP type norm. Although it's not LP, it's the outer LP coming from the geometric structure of trees and so on. This one here in particular is what's called an iterated outer Lebesgue space because we have here an outer Lebesgue space and then another one using the, st the structure not only of trees but also of sets called strips, which is where you have localization in time but nothing about frequency. It is complicated, anyway. The important thing is that these function spaces, they're spaces of generalized functions, not just classical functions, but functions into this space of generalized distributions on our particular Frechet space of wave packets. Yeah. It's a complicated result, but this is the main result ultimately of the whole framework that makes everything work. They're what you would call modulation invariant Carlson embeddings modulation invariant because this time frequency space here that everything is based on involves a modulation parameter or a frequency parameter. Anyway, I'll show you how to use this to actually prove our estimates. How do you bound the bilinear Hilbert transform? You take the form or the trilinear form associated with the bilinear Hilbert transform. And what we do is we write it as a sum of the Holder form, the product of the three functions through pi, which is bounded. And this other thing here, this complicated expression that was so long I had to shrink it to fit it on the slide. It's given in terms of the bounded, uh, I'm thinking of a trilinear form here, pi, it's the same thing. Trilinear form pi, adjoint to the bilinear operator pi. And you take your embedding maps and you evaluate them at different frequency points, this particular combination here. And you integrate that over your time frequency space, R3 plus. This is what we'll call a wave packet form associated with phi because there's a particular phi for which this works or a class of phi's for which this works. And it's an operator on the time frequency space or on functions on the time frequency space. So what we then prove is that this wave packet form on generalized functions, even not just embedded functions on generalized functions actually satisfies a, a bound with respect to the outer Lebesgue spaces that I mentioned before, with these particular sizes that I defined a couple of slides back. Um, proving this estimate is basically what tells you what the size has to be. When you do all of the applications of Holder's inequality and the weird integrations by parts and stuff like that, this estimate is surprisingly hard to prove. We had a lot of issues proving this estimate. But it's, yeah, it's out of Lebesgue theory, but the actual estimate you have to prove is on a single tree at a time. It's what you call a single tree estimate. The outer Lebesgue theory then gives you something on the whole space, not just trees. Right, so once you prove that, then you substitute in, okay, not just general FI, but you take in embedded functions. You prove that the, you use the, the bound for the embedded, for the embedding maps that was on the previous slide for the right choice of exponents, at least. So when you do all of this correctly, you get the bounds for the BHT that you wanted. You start here and you end up with product of this on the right-hand side and you're done. Although I've swept a lot of technicalities under the rug in telling you that. So how do you bound operator valued Fourier multipliers? 
not just BHT. So this is our definition of the, the multiplier with symbol M. So the, the pairing is, is this, M is a trilinear form valued symbol. You represent that as a superposition of wave packet form type operators. So you have operators of this form here. I haven't defined them yet. And they will have symbols and wave packets associated with them. You have to derive this. This is not, this is nowhere near immediate, but these wave packet multipliers, they have a symbol which is defined on the whole time frequency space and they're form valued. They're defined like this. This is the same kind of thing we had before when we got this expression on the previous slide for the BHT, these wave packet forms here. But now we allow the trilinear form to vary. In this particular case, they only depend on eta and t. There's no y dependence, but in general, we also have a bound for y dependent wave packet forms. You have some vectors alpha and beta lying around that quantifies where the singularity of the multipliers lie. And then you prove the same kind of estimate as before. You take these wave packet forms and you show on generalized functions that you have this kind of single tree estimate with an appropriate norm on the symbol. And the proof of that is essentially the same as the corresponding proof of the BHT, but slightly harder. Yeah, slightly harder, not exceptionally harder. And then I didn't say, then you use, you substitute in E of FI into here and you use the bound that we already proved, the modulation invariant Carlson embedding. Same technique, just a different setting. Now variational Carlson operators, somewhat different form. What we do is we look at linearized variational Carlson operators where instead of looking at a supremum over all frequencies, you take a kind of selection function C. It's valued in sequences of frequencies that are increasing. And you look at the, the LR norm of that guy, of that vector. And when you take the supremum over all choices of C, you get the variational Carlson operator. The difference is that these individual operators with a single choice of C, they're linear. Whereas when you take a supremum, it only becomes sublinear. So we need to show estimates for these operators uniformly in the selection function C. You do it by proving some kind of wave packet decomposition. So this involves an integral over the time frequency space of the embedding map of F that I mentioned before, and some other embedding map associated with G. So G is a, a, a Schwartz function valued sequence now because we're testing an LR norm, we have to, yeah. This is complicated and I'm not really explaining it very well, but we have an, another embedding type map associated with the, the choice of frequency C. It involves some functions here that are called truncated wave packets and Gennady was the one who really masterminded all this and figured out how to make that work as far as I know. So what do you have? Before I go back to that, we now have one of these wave packet embeddings of this operator that we need to bound involving an embedding that we already know about and another embedding. So you do the same kind of single tree estimate that you do for the BHT or for Fourier multipliers, except here it's in the, the bilinear case instead of the trilinear case. So it's a little bit easier. You bound it by the outer Lebesgue norms of F and G. And now there's another size that's involved. It's not the same size as this one. It's a dual one, but it's not too complicated. I won't talk about it here though. You use the modulation invariant Carlson embedding that you already have, and you prove another embedding, another embedding bound for the, the embedding A that shows up. I would advise not thinking too hard about all the assumptions and exponents here, just this boundedness of an appropriate embedding map, we prove it. We don't use the intermediate, UM, we use UMD, but we don't use intermediate, we use type, uh, Rademacher type R prime, which follows from the, the intermediacy assumptions that we really need for, for this embedding map here. Yeah, don't think too hard about that. So my last five minutes, because I've sort of told you already about the main results. Let's look to the future a little bit. What's missing in all of this theory? What's the key layering emission that's staring us in the face the whole time? We don't know how to deal with Lebesgue spaces properly. We have this assumption on of intermediacy that was really getting in our way. So just looking at the bilinear Hilbert transform and how we bounded that for a given bilinear form pi, 
we had this wave packet form, we proved a, a holder type inequality, the single tree estimate, you know, and then we use the modulation invariant Carlson embedding here. This step is the only one that uses what pi is. Once you prove this estimate, pi is gone. Pi has vanished. All of pi has been used up in proving the first estimate. And to actually get this estimate for the correct exponents, exponents such that these p and q satisfy the and s satisfy the right holder relations, but that you also have this bound here, you end up needing that h x i is r i intermediate umd, and that you have this sort of super holder scaling. This is where this assumption comes from. And what that does is it lets you ignore the structure of pi. We don't use any structure of pi other than boundedness, right? But we know that for specific Barnack spaces, particular Barnack spaces, and for particular choices of pi, this condition is completely unnecessary. You've got the helicoidal method that gives you a result for mixed norm spaces. You do not need this assumption there. You've got this result of Loris and Neuhardt. If you have Barnack function spaces, and if you look at the product of the Barnack function spaces, so that you've got like a bounded product map between these things, they have a notion of bilinear UMD which isn't just the UMD property for each XI. If this pair X1, X2 is bilinear UMD in a certain sense that uses the fact that these are Barnack function spaces, then you have a large range of exponents such that the bilinear Hilbert transform associated with the product map is bounded. In particular, you do not need this condition, not at all. So let's have a look at that theorem. They've got this concept of bilinear UMD and multilinear UMD more generally. And what this concept is really saying, if you think of it very conceptually, is not that this pair x1, x2 is UMD, but that the product map is UMD. You have the notion of an operator being UMD, not just a Barnack space. And really this is an assumption on this particular bilinear map. And this raises some questions. How do you generalize that concept of multilinear UMD? What, what would it mean for a general bilinear operator between some Barnack spaces to be bilinear UMD? We have some ideas. I'm not going to give it all away because we're still working on this, but we have some ideas what to do here. And if you have a concept of multilinear UMD of such a bilinear form, it, does that give you bound, should that give you boundedness of the bilinear Hilbert transform associated with that operator? should it or will it or whatever. I should add about the multilinear UMD concept. They don't need the individual spaces X1 and X2 to be UMD even. You can have examples where both of them are not UMD or even this one here, none of them have to be UMD. It's just that this product map has enough regularizing structure that the, the triple of spaces somehow becomes good. And we're, yeah, we're thinking about how to generalize this, but we don't really know that's open questions for the future. I think this is my last slide. Thanks for your attention. Questions? Yeah. Thank you, Alex, for the nice talk. Is there any question? Yeah, I have one. Yep. Uh, is there a kind of uh, more toy setting in which uh, this multilinear UMD concept becomes important? Which is toy, I can't hear you very well. Did you say a, a toy setting? Uh, sorry, I'll switch to a different design. Okay. Maybe any other questions while Pavel switching? I yep. have a question then. So when, when you have the R intermediate space. Yeah. So basically the, the conjecture is that every U and D space is an R intermediate space. Yeah. So if you're doing the, the complex uh, interpolation between a Nilbert space and, and uh, an R intermediate U and D, have yeah. you gained, uh, anything or? Like um, right yes, right. if you can ensure compatibility of all of the interpolation structures involved, then yeah, you gain a, a bit of that. I would actually, there's a conjecture that I didn't write down, um, 
maybe I can get back to the right slide. Uh, sorry, I'm going further back. Than, yeah, here we go. The conjectures that every UMD space is R intermediate UMD. I would conjecture that every every R intermediate UMD space for R greater than two is R minus epsilon intermediate. <laughs> I would conjecture that. I have conjectured that. Um, it's not immediately clear to me that the this conjecture here would imply that you have to, there's some interpolation theory technicalities you have to deal with. For finite dimensional spaces, you can do it quantitatively and it's true, but it's it has to do with compatibility of interpolation structures. But if you can guarantee this kind of compatibility, like all of the spaces can be compared with each other in an interpolative sense, then yeah, if you interpolate with an R intermediate UMD space, you get a, an R minus epsilon intermediate UMD space for some epsilon depending on how far you interpolate. I think that was your question. Yeah, 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 in some sense, yeah, yes. Good. But then the question is like, I mean, so now you would reapply the thing to R minus epsilon and obtain R minus epsilon minus epsilon prime. Yep. But the epsilons, of course, don't have to keep getting, they're gonna have to get small, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Cool. Now Pavel can ask his question. Yeah. So is there oh, some? Much better now. Yeah. <laughs> is there some simpler question to which this uh, bilinear UMD condition provides an answer? Like uh, the UMD condition characterizes spaces for which vector valued uh, Hilbert transform is bounded. Yeah, you don't need. Is... Any yeah. time frequency analysis to get interested in UMD exactly. spaces. Exactly, we, we wouldn't need time frequency analysis for this whole question. Like the motivating question that I've given is really BHT, but there's nothing saying you have to use BHT as your model here, right? You can look at para products, for example. I would say para products are probably the most appropriate. I wouldn't say toy problem, but non-time frequency problem. Like it's intrinsically a multi-linear question, so you have to ask what is the simplest multi-linear operator that I want to be able to deal with? The answer is probably power products. And so you can talk about classical power products, Martingale power products, you know, the Walsh setting if you want, and you can try to formulate all these questions. Incidentally, the Loris Neuhart condition for multilinear UMD is actually an analog of the Hardy Littlewood property. So they're using the, the Hardy Littlewood, the, the Barnard function space or the lattice Hardy Littlewood maximal operator and talking about the boundedness of that Actually, yeah, it's multilinear. So they're looking at a multi sublinear version of the, the lattice Hardy Littlewood maximal operator. So the questions involved would be like, okay, if you have this particular multilinear UMD property, what are the other equivalent conditions for that? And in this multilinear setting, you actually have a, a lot of operators you could choose. In a linear setting, everything, okay, it doesn't all collapse, but you don't have so many operators. In the multilinear setting, you have different degrees of difficulty of operators. You've got power products, you've got operators with singularity on a line, you've got operators with singularity on a larger set. Which ones of these should be bounded and which ones need not? This is all wide open. Yeah. Plenty of good questions there. So maybe related to that, so uh, it's clear that when you do this R intermediate spaces, it's clear how you, you have to say something about modulation invariance or something about Fourier analysis in that sense, yeah. right? And when you interpolate with a Hilbert space, it's still plausible that the Hilbert space on the other end knows Fourier analysis. Yeah. So you said bilinear UMD, that seems to be completely, it doesn't see the Fourier transform, right? I mean, I don't know the definition. Yeah, this is part of the question. This is interesting, yeah. You're not cheating. You're not defining bilinear in such a way that it's geared towards BHT, is that right? No, I mean, we, we don't want to define it in that way, but BHT is kind of one of the natural testing conditions. Like once you have a formulation of of some notion of multilinear UMD, you start to ask yourselves, yourself, does multilinear UMD imply boundedness of power products? Does it imply boundedness of BHT? Does it imply sparse domination of these operators? Does it imply this? Does it imply that? They may not all be equivalent. Maybe they are, but maybe they're not. And um, well, what did I want to say? Actually, what the Loris Neuhart result is, is that if they've got, if you have a Barnard function tuple 
that's multilinear UMD, and if you have a scalar valued operator that has sparse domination, then the extension of that operator also has sparse domination. This is their full result. In particular, BHT has enough sparse domination to, to apply their result, but it applies to anything that has sparse domination in a certain sense. Which means they have a whole scale of multilinear UMD because you can have sparse domination with different exponents. And that leads to UMD RS, <laughs> the exponents R and S. And multilinear UMD is like UMD 1, 1. You can get weaker versions. Yeah. Yeah, and I have another question. Uh, yeah. You could try to combine the helicoidal method with U6. If you look at oh, yeah. the iterated LP of Muscalo and Veneer, you could make the inner one the Banach value, right? And then you can ask questions such as boundless. And then in a way, the inner one could be RUFD, for example. Then neither the helicoidal nor your works because yep. you have this thing in between. Is that right? Or is, is, is yeah, that this is a completely valid question. And unfortunately, I can't answer it. We have tried. This is what we were talking about in Oberwolfa with Gennady and everything. Like, what is the link really between sparse domination and the, not sparse, the, the helicoidal method and and this framework? They seem pretty much disjoint somehow. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, and I find this quite intriguing. Yeah, in particular, yeah, I saw more about, uh, and we've been talking earlier about trying to generate banner spaces that give you examples, right, about mm -hmm. something is UMD or not UMD or any of these is this intermediate UMD. Uh, that's a, it's an implied by UMD, right? You want to create examples of Banach spaces. And we were talking earlier, well, let's take a iterated LP of LQ of LR. Yeah. Let's look at sequences and see what... Have you looked at some spaces or does it make sense to look at spaces where these sequences tend to infinity? I guess we've been look, looking at things where they tend to L2 or so, but yeah, you, you could try to have the sequence go to infinity, maybe have five... It's never going to be UMD because it's going to contain copies of LP as iso isometrically as subspaces for arbitrarily, like uniformly for arbitrarily large P. And that's gonna prevent it from being UMD if you take that example that I think you're trying to construct, no matter how slowly the convergence uh, happens or the so, the so to speak, one variation is the sharp cutoff there, right? The one yeah, this is gonna confuse uh, everybody else because they weren't in the discussion we were having before. <laughs> Sorry for that, yeah, 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 anyway. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, but it's, it's 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 intriguing to me how this iteration of these LP spaces allows yeah. will be there. Seems I, to I actually suspect, and this with with regard to the question of constructing examples and counterexamples, I think the most fruitful way of finding counterexamples, in particular, for this multilinear UMD setting, whatever that is. I mean, we're coming up with hypothetical definitions here. The best way of coming up with pathological examples isn't going to be to vary the Banach spaces, but to vary the operator, right? So we have this notion actually of a bilinear operator being multilinear UMD. And already we know that if you take these X's to be LP spaces, then taking pi to be the BHT on scalar valued spaces already gives you a kind of pathological example. In this example, the individual spaces can be UMD, but the operator linking them can be sort of degenerate in a way, and you don't get the nice properties you'd expect. So this isn't, in a sense, this isn't a Banach space question. This is an operator theory question, in a sense. No, wait, the question where the intermediate UMD is the same uh, as UMD. Not that, I was thinking in terms of multilinear. I mean, the question, the linear questions, yeah, this is different, yeah. And okay, I can't say very much on how to construct counterexamples. The story has its own questions. And yeah, the, I'm thinking now about like, what is, what's new in the multilinear setting that just doesn't appear in the linear setting? So there's one particular bilinear map, which is if one of the two Banach spaces is just scalar, right? And you just yep. take a scalar. Is, is there anything that nothing interesting there? Or, um, or in that case? I don't think you get much interesting there, but don't quote me on that. I think like one of the examples that's important is where you take X and you take X dual and then you take C. Or of course, yeah, you can take X and you can take C and then you can take X, right? The multilinear properties of these examples are basically just linear properties of X. Right, because if you take the second example, any bilinear operator is just going to be a linear operator on x times a scalar, is it not? 
I think that's the case. And here, like any bilinear operator is essentially going to be the dual pairing, maybe with some contractions and stuff happening. But yeah, I think to get truly new behavior, you need to look at three different Barnack spaces here. Or even you take like X, we take L2 yeah, and L infinity yeah, okay. and L2. That's actually quite interesting too. Yeah. 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 All right. Mm -hmm. But but if you take an, some operator, so uh, what would be the usual UMD condition in terms of this bilinear UMD? Would it be that the identity operator is, U, is UMD? Um, in the case of function spaces, at least in the Loris Nihat framework, they're taking X and X dual and L1 of the measure space that they're working over. And mm -hmm. then their condition involves basically sparse domination of a bi sublinear maximal operator. But that ends up reducing to the boundedness of the Hardy Littlewood maximal operator on X valued functions and on X star valued functions, which by result of Borgam is equivalent to X being UMD. <laughs> so. Yeah, so maybe there is something interesting also in the linear, not bilinear setting, if you just take operators other than the identity. Yeah, when you start to take different operators then it gets interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure of the relation between say in the Barnard function space setting, taking an operator that's not the product map and still looking at these multi-sublinear maximal functions. I'm not sure what would happen there, but it's worth looking at. Well, we have Emil as a speaker in a couple of weeks, right? Emil Loris. And he's, well, he's, uh, of... he's going to speak at the end of January. End of January. I don't know why I thought it was a couple of weeks. Oh, he's... Oh, he's listed two speakers after me on the website, but that's not yes. in the accounts. Yeah, okay. <laughs> ask, ask him. He will know, I think, more about this than me. He knows a lot more than me about Barnard function spaces. The problem is for general Barnard spaces, you don't have this lattice Hardy Littlewood maximal operator to work with. You simply can't define it. So, yeah. So we need something new there. Is there any other question for Alex? Seems not. Okay. If not, we can thank Alex again. Thanks. I will quickly advertise if you want to learn more about Barnack Valued Analysis, I have a course right now and it's on YouTube. <laughs> it's also you know, a master course. So if you've and it's got some nice lecture notes and things like that. So feel free to look at that if this course, if this talk was not enough for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alex. I guess I can stop recording.